Mr. Zimmerman. Good morning, Chief Judge Bell, members of the court. I think the issues in this case, in a sense, have been percolating and hovering about land use law for the last 27 years since Schultz versus Pritz and have been touched on, I think, over the years in various cases. But I think the issues are presented particularly starkly in the present case. I'm going to try to hit some central points in 14 minutes and then give way to Mr. Nelson. I think the major problem in this case is that the County Board of Appeals explicitly refused even to consider or take into account evidence, which happens to be undisputed, but evidence of the relatively greater magnitude of specifically identified agricultural and environmental adverse effects of the use at this Parkton site compared to many other areas in the zone. It wasn't a question of the board not believing certain evidence. It wasn't a question of them resolving disputed issues of fact on this point. The board simply said that it was not going to take into account any evidence of adverse impacts at locations outside the immediate vicinity. It's our view that without taking this evidence into account, it is logically, practically, and by common sense impossible to meet the Schultz standard, impossible to conclude that the adverse effects are inherent in the use and similar regardless of where the use is located in the zone. Effectively, the Board of Appeals substituted the vicinity for the zone that Judge Davidson referred to, and I would respectfully suggest made the zone invisible. And in the context of this case, especially in an agricultural zone, virtually converted the special exception conditional use into a use by right. And I would suggest that the board's opinion, which we discussed in our brief, it's not just a question of inartful words or words that are not quite precise, but nevertheless a proper thought process. I think the board's thought process had a gap, in a sense a short circuit, and gave a totally incomplete analysis by its refusal to take the zone into account. I think in simple terms, what Judge Davidson's message was in Schultz v. Pritz, and repeated in many cases throughout the years, for conditional uses, there are some places in each zone which are appropriate for the use, and there are some which are not appropriate. The standard is helping us to determine which locations fit in which category. And I would suggest that the meaning of the standard this court has evolved can be put in colloquial language, that some locations involve average adverse effects, ordinary for that use. Some locations would be better than average, some worse than average, with disproportionate impacts. And the concept is that the special exception uses can go into locations where the adverse effects are fairly average or better, but they're not supposed to go to locations where the adverse effects are above average, above and beyond those elsewhere in the zone. In any special exception case, then, under your view, you would argue under Schultz v. Pritz's view, that for an applicant to sustain its burden, they would not only have to take their proposed use at the site that they control and demonstrate what effects in the immediate vicinity would occur from their proposed use, but they'd have to take that and pick it up and move it and analyze the same thing in how many locations everywhere in, let's say, the county, where that zone exists that could physically accommodate that use. I think that in each case, there has to be undertaken a reasonable evaluation. 
and the amount of evidence can be weighed in a particular case, but the attempt has to be made. I've never said that every property in the zone has to be looked at, but in each, in each different type of zone, depending on the legislative purpose, it is feasible to look at different areas. In the agricultural zone, it can be done by reg regions, as was done by several of the witnesses for the citizens in this case, identifying uh, areas of the zone where there were smaller and less productive farms, for example, where there's existing encroachment, where there are villages, and specific areas were also identified, such as the, the Shawan area, the Granite area, the Bird River area. Um, like, as in, with many legal standards, uh, which are objective standards, they nevertheless have to be uh, applied in each case on a case-by-case -case basis. What is unique under zoning law? Uh, you know, that involves some com comparative thinking. Um, and we, we can't give a mathematical, we're, we're not suggesting there's a mathematical rule to tell you how many properties you have to look at. So under your view, that would be left to be, shall we say, fought out in each individual case. That's right. But between the, the planning staff, neighbors, what have you, and the applicant. Well, evidence can be presented by all sides. And Frank, we gave another example of that in the appendix to our brief, where we happened to have a case in the Court of Special Appeals where both sides presented evidence on comparison. Does, does that, that uh, expansive um, comparative analysis only go to inherent adverse effects of the proposed special exception use or all effects? I think depending on the case, it can go to all, all effects. Does it de is it determinative of the legislative history of when the local government created the special exception use in the zoning ordinance? For example, we, we have a lot of discussion of funeral homes, um, and mostly they fix on the notion that the legislative body made it a special exception use because of its inherent deleterious effects on the value of adjacent properties and the enjoyment of adjacent properties. I mean, does, do you look into the legislative history of each special exception use as it was created well, and say, did they, what, what inherent deleterious effects did they determine that caused it to be a special exception as opposed to a permitted use as opposed to a prohibited use? Well, I would suggest in general one has to look at the legislative intent of the particular zone. And we've cited the legislative findings as the agricultural zone. Now, if there was a specific legislative history as to why, whether we call this a camp or a school, whatever we call this use, uh, if there's specific legislative history as to why that was placed in the category, then we would consider that also. I don't know that we have that exact history in this case but we certainly have to consider the context of the, the legislative findings and intent of the zone in, in order to help identify the relevant adverse effects that, that the, the legislature was considering. In this case, encroachment into prime agricultural areas and sprawl um, and protection of the prime and productive farms. Those are That some focuses on the purpose of the underlying zone, not the reason why the special exception use was created as a conditionally allowable use in that zone. Well, in the absence of more detailed legislative history, I think all we can look at at this point is the legislative intent of the particular zone, and, and we can uh, infer that all of the special exception uses have to be evaluated because the legislature considered them potentially problematic with respect to those uh, findings on, on the zone. I don't think we normally have a lot of, sometimes we might have a detailed history as to why one particular use were, were, were made a special exception use, but I don't think we have that. In fact, there's even some debate as to where to fit this use within the use category. So that's, I think, the best I can, can do on that. Let me betray my total lack of understanding about zoning law, and I certainly defer to my colleague. <laughs> Um, but taking everything that you've just discussed about looking at all effects, basically adverse effects, and um, having to look at possibly a number of locations, and 
I gather, taking this school or whatever you call it and seeing whether it could fit in a number of, in any other location, right? This is, this is where I have a lack of understanding. Is it only locations that are available that could be, I mean, because ultimately, if you don't consider availability of another zoned area for this special exception, then they are limited. The owner of the property is effectively limited to using the tract that he or she owns to farming. Well, the owner has a number of potential uses, including farming. There are other per uses permitted by right. But I mean, but in the sense it, of it, 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 the owner can't, it can't go out and just buy another tract where it might be more appropriate if it's not available. Well, so, I, yeah. but well, they, but then, then the limitation becomes X. Well, here, of course, it's, it's somebody who wants to buy property who's bought it. But availability is not the criterion under okay. Schultz versus Prince. What I'm suggesting is, and what applicants don't do and what Loyola didn't do, they don't really follow the Schultz thought process. They don't look at the zone and say, all right, which are the areas that are average or better than average for this kind of use in terms of adverse effects? And then try to find places in appropriate locations. What applicants do, and as far as the record shows here, they just take a place that they want all right, they wanted this location. And you know, it's a beautiful location. You can see that on the record. Uh, but then they go back and try to justify it and say, all right, we got this location. Now let's get some experts in to say there's no adverse effects. And you know, experts in zoning cases, I think, are in a different category than in many other cases. They often just come in and they'll say, OK, there's no adverse effects. But if, if they're not matching up with the Schultz versus Pritt standard, that Like vo vocational rehabilitation experts. Well, this is a little, a little different here, but I but guess But this would be true if they were the farmer who owned the land. Right. I mean, in the sense that it doesn't matter whether they pick out um, this plot of land and want to put the school there without considering the adverse impact. If the farmer owned the land. Right. Who did? It sounds like the farmer in the Dell, but farmer owned the land, um, then the farmer couldn't build this no. structure unless he showed or she showed. That's absolutely right. Okay. Some locations are inappropriate, period. There's no confiscation. This property was farmed for 100 or more years. And most farms or areas are farmed. But and if there are it's some not, other. If, if, if the location's not inappropriate, it, the determination of whether the location is appropriate is, is, is the essence of what we're talking about here, right, and what standard is there to be applied. And you get these factors set out in the ordinance. And then you're saying you have to go beyond that. If, even though it doesn't have any adverse environmental effect and it doesn't affect traffic and, well, doesn't affect the public health and safety and welfare, you still have to go and look to other specific sites in the county to see whether some adverse effect would be less. That, that's your position. Well, I don't think it, Is I, it, I don't accept the premise that there, there's no adverse effects here. Clearly there was Im evidence of impact on agriculture. Uh, there was a, a problem with the Fourth Mine Branch Stream. There were narrow and winding roads issues. What I'm saying is that the Board of Appeals cannot properly make a, come to a conclusion that the adverse impact is quote unquote minimal or inherent or insignificant under the Schultz standard. I'm not trying to add anything. I'm trying to interpret what this court meant. In well, the take a look at the facts in Schultz. And what was done in that case to determine compliance with the standards set in that case. I mean, how far and wide was the analysis um, in that case which involved a funeral home? We had, they didn't go all over the entire county, well, obviously. They didn't go beyond that particular location. Well, right. In that, if they didn't have to go that far at that point because they were rejecting the earlier GAL rule that, that you couldn't grant a special exception just because it was 
no greater adverse effects than a permitted use by right. So then the court remanded the case for further consideration. It didn't. Yeah, but consideration under the standards it set forth. And there's not one word or hint about going to other in other areas. The standards above and beyond what the adverse effects would be elsewhere within the zone. I read the zone to mean the zone, the entire zone, looking at it reasonably on a case-by-case -case basis. I, I don't know what the, the light that is. Mean, that means your time's up. All right. Uh, but you can finish answering Judge Eldridge's question. Well, I would just say I read, and I know Judge Eldridge, you, you were on the court at that time, I think. But and nobody even ever thought that we were saying anything more than at the location where the funeral was. Well, I think was to be. That's the way I read the language, and I think it's a reasonable. I, not only do I think I'm reading it correctly from my reading point of view, but I think it's it's the logical way to approach it that one can't uh, make a. You, you, I mean, you may or may not be right, but my point is, I don't think it's a word in Schultz. That, that helps your theory. Well, what I would then say it's the reasonable and logical way to approach it. Uh, otherwise, the special exceptions become almost meaningless. Thank you, sir. Mr. Nelson. Please, uh, the court. Macy Nelson, on behalf of uh, the Citizen Protestant Sun, on their behalf, I wanted to thank the court for granting uh, cert in this case. It's something that we're grateful for and don't. Uh, uh, take for granted, although it's not really relevant to the narrow Schultz issue in this case. One of my clients, Lynn Jones, is on a farm very close by that's been in her family since 1765, I think. So it might, this might be folks have a, a real uh, stake uh, in this community. But let Do me- Do you have any philosophical differences with Mr. Zimmerman's argument? Not philosophical, but I would articulate it differently. I would say this, this is what Schultz says. Schultz says you need to look at the proposed use and its effects, adverse effects, at the proposed site. Proposed use at the proposed site. Then you've got to look at the proposed, the proposed use, not a larger version of the proposed use, but the proposed use at a reasonable number of other sites. Where do you find that reasonable number of other in, in language in Schultz? Because I can't. Okay, I have two questions. Pending. May I finish Judge Harrell's and answer your, your answer? It's part of the same okay. thing, your answer. Um, Schultz and its progeny okay. use the language about, as compared to <laughs> elsewhere in the zone, that language appears. This court, in the four cases that talk about Schultz, quote that language, Holbrook, Leighton, uh, Alviani, they all quote that language. They don't discuss what it means. The Court of Special Appeals, Judge Wilner in Gotak says it expressly. The Lucas Court says it expressly. Food Orion says it expressly. The Hanley case says expressly. So Judge Eldridge, I must respectfully disagree. What you're saying you. is a group of Court of Special Appeals cases have so interpreted Schultz. In the language. I wasn't talking about the Court of Special Appeals okay, cases. And the language appears in the, the four cases that this court has cited Schultz in, quotes the very language on which Mr. Zimmerman and I base our arguments. So, do you have any, any of these cases have a record where the local zoning body did consider the proposed special exception use and its, its effects at multiple locations throughout their jurisdiction? Lucas, okay. clearly. Uh, I, I tried the Lucas case. This is where we, we advanced this theory. We hammered it home. We had evidence of other sites in the, in the northern county where the, the topography was different, where the, where the size of the parcels was different, where there were croplands as opposed to horse farms. Yes, sir, Lucas, we did it head on. We made the record and we won the case. Affirmed the Court of Special Appeals. In the Court of Appeals, this is the first case where we have, this, where the parties have staked out their position. That's what, as a lawyer, that's why this case, to me, is interesting because there's no ambiguity. No one's arguing waiver. No one's arguing substantial evidence. Loyola says we can't look at other sites. We say you must look at other sites, and 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 the, the case is perfectly positioned because there's no uh, ambiguity. So, 
You're absolutely right. It's teed up here. Uh, but, uh, Judge Harrell, you asked uh, Mr. Zimmerman, and I wanted to respond to your question about whether I agree. Yes, philosophically, I stated differently. He talks about the average site. I talk about representative sites. That's why we looked at the bird uh, in Baltimore County. You have the Bird River RC2 land, which is over near the river. It's different. You have then you have the over near Howard County granite. It's different. You have the northern Baltimore County with the big farms, big croplands. Then you have the, the Schwann Valley, Wortham Valley, and Greenspring Valley. It's all different, but those are the basic region. So we tried to pick sites, representative sites from those general areas, even though we don't have the burden to prove, where we said, look, here are, the, here are examples where the effect would be less. Why? There are wider roads with shoulders. Why? There's no class three trout stream. Why? Because the farmland, although zone RC2, is already cut up and destroyed. That was our theme, although we had not the burden of proof. They did, and they made the tactical decision. It, it was clearly, and I don't say this critically, I say this as a lawyer, they made the tactical legal decision, we're going to stake out a position and we say we don't need to do that. Judge Pataglia asked, well, what if the land, they don't own it? Availability is not the issue. I think this case, the, 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 the point I would add to, to, to emphasize what Mr. Zimmerman said is that under, I believe under Schultz, under Hammond, under Turner, under um, all those cases, and under the Baltimore County zoning regulation, the applicant has the burden. We don't, my clients don't have the burden, the applicant has the burden to come forward with this evidence. And I, and I, would, I would articulate this, this evidence of these other representative sites as really, it's almost like a prima facie element of the tort. And if you don't have that element, you fail as a matter of law. That's why we respectfully suggest at the end of this case, this court needs to, or should, we urge the court to, to reverse outright, not remand, because there is no evidence of this fundamental element of the prima facie case. I, I think this, to, to, I think the court also has to consider what does the word presumption mean in the Schultz case? This is where, I, I think this is the source of all our struggle with this, with this body of law, is that we look at my, the land use preservation community looks at Schultz and they see the holding although Judge Eldridge has articulated a little bit differently than I do, as saying, we say you gotta look at other sites. That's what we say. The development community says, whoa, 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 wait a minute. What about this language presumption? There's a presumption that it's okay. And I think that's the source of this conflict. And I would suggest this interpretation of that sentence about presumption. And the Hanley case in the Court of Special Appeals uh, is the, really the source of this thing. But if the applicant meet its, can meet its burden to prove all the statutory requirements and prove its obligation to comply with Schultz, then it's presumed that you can get the special exception uh, permission. I think that's what uh, that language. And that would mean that they would prove that there is no site, albeit unavailable, that would be better. If they could prove that. Not no site. I, I would say different. I would say they have the burden to prove that here is evidence of several other representative sites. Mm -hmm. And if we're dealing with a county where every parcel of land is exactly the same, you could have one site maybe. But if there's a diversity as we have in Baltimore County and in many counties, you have representative sites. I think in this case, three or four sites. Why? Because I think of Bird River, I think of Granite, I think of the northern south of Baltimore County, I think of the Schwann, the horse farm area. Would that issue, as Judge Harrell asked, be subject to dispute? I mean, would that be the an issue before? Yes. Uh, before would that be an issue before a zoning board? Absolutely. So we go to a zoning body. They present their case. Representative, they have a land planner. Here are some representative sites. We think this is the applicant speaking now. That our adverse effects will be no greater at our site than there. Right. Then, then if the community has a, a theory, a case, they present their. Right. All right. And then there's the decision under the standard review. If there's substantial evidence, <coughs> we defer to the factual finding. No, I understand that. But what I'm asking is, if they if they proved that no other site or the sites that were 
presented and everyone agrees that they are representative for purposes of my hypothetical, then they could have this, they could actually build a school is what you're saying. If they, if they have evidence and if the fact finder accepts that evidence that the, there's no greater adverse impact here than there would be at a, at a representative right. number of other sites, whether it be two, three, four, or five, yes, they get it. it. Is it really just adverse effects or is it inherent adverse effects? That, that's maybe why Schultz v. Pritz, while it answered some questions, probably created more problems than it solved. It created a lot of problems. Uh, because they were trying to come up with a principled explanation for why when a legislative body sits down to write a zoning ordinance or rewrite a zoning ordinance, they make a distinction between, well, let's put this in the permitted use category, but let's put this in the conditional or special exception use category, and they came up with this rationalization. I've spent a lot of time, I agree with Your Honor, about Schultz. And I've spent a lot of time arguing what Schultz means, and my thinking has evolved over time. And I realize that different people see it differently. There are problems. It took me a while to sort that out. But to get back to my question of inherent, are we really only talking about inherent adverse effects? That 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 seems to be the basis in Schultz for why something is a special exception as opposed to a permitted use when the legislative body sits down and cast them into the seventh circle of hell or the sixth circle of hell. The point I was going to make was that part of my thought process is about this word inherent. And if we look at the text, it's at pages 22, 23 of the Schultz op opinion. It doesn't say inherent in the special exception used as listed in the zoning ordinance. It doesn't say that. Inherently associated with such a special exception use. Well, such. So you go to the grammar text, Irrespective of is an antecedent phrase. Mm. So you go back to the, the, the previous subject, that. which is the proposed use. So we're talking it's, about the inherent adverse effects of, of the proposed yeah. use. Well, it's kind of odd how they got the station. When you look at the, 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 I think that Judge Davison writing for the court really started, relied a great deal on Anderson versus Sawyer. And that's where the explication was that she embraced and then sprang from there to this standard. Um, and it, it, uh, Anderson versus Sawyer says inherent adverse effects of the special exception. Yes. So that was, it's almost as if she was saying at the time they created the special exception as a possibility, they must have had in mind certain inherent adverse effects. And that's what you want to look at if you're going to look at anything for comparison's sake. May I answer that question? Sure. Yes, you may. Sure. I'm aware of that distinction. I think that if you really parse the words in Schultz, it's talking about the inherent adverse effects of the proposed use, because she uses the word of, the, of such a special, special exception use, and that limitation, that antecedent phrase was not used in the Anderson case. I, I've looked at the question very carefully. It's not there. And to me, Schultz is a little bit different than Anderson for that reason. There were some other issues I can touch. Traffic, I'll do it my rub about rebuttal. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you, sir. Sorry to go over there. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Mr. Dunbar. Thank you, Your Honor. And with me is Mr. Christopher Mudd of a long line of lawyers from Southern Maryland. I want to start by addressing the last thing that Mr. Nelson said, because I think it highlights the fundamental problem with the argument made by the appellants in this case. Their argument fails to appreciate what the Baltimore County Council did in 1975 when they created the RC2 zone and in the several occasions over the years when they've amended it to change the mix of the sixth circle of hell or the seventh circle of hell permitted versus special exception uses. What they did in 1975 when they created the RC2 zone was they said in the findings our rural land is being affected by urban uses and residential sprawl. So we're going to keep them out or severely restrict them in this zone. We're going to permit, and remember this is 1975 so the special exception law 
from Anderson and Dean and other cases like that is already in place. We're going to permit, by special exception, schools and churches and other things. That legislative decision, as this court and the Court of Special Appeals has said time and time again, has a meaning. It means they looked at it, they made a complicated decision, a political decision, as, as land use decisions tend to be, and they said, it is our judgment that a school, including colleges, is an acceptable use in the RC2 zone, notwithstanding our concerns about resi residential development and urban uses. And that is why, under the case law, it is presumed to be acceptable if you meet these standards. And the standards they listed in the statute. There's one about agricultural land, and the other ones are health and welfare and all those other matters. That's the presumption that we're working with. And the result of that is that the, is that the Baltimore County Council considered whether a school's impact would be one that would be incompatible or compatible with the RC2 zone. And they said, we're willing to accept the inherent impact of a school, but if there's something about the particular school in a particular place, then that would not be acceptable. That is the ultimate meaning of the Schultz versus Pritz case. It's a legislative decision being carried out by the local expertise of the local zoning body. So when Mr. Nelson says, if you parse the language on pages 21 and 22 of Schultz versus Pritz and says the comparison in this case would be between Loyola's 10 acre retreat center that's going to be used about 160 days of a year here and you got to compare it with some other sites in the zone although they're not actually willing to identify why a particular set of sites would be reasonable and another one would not but you got to compare it with some other sites in the zone that's the wrong test, because if you look at Schultz, there are two compelling aspects of it. One is the level of deference to the legislative determination about what's compatible and what's not compatible. When the legislature was making its determination to classify schools as a special exception use in the RC2 zone, that means that what it had in mind in terms of inherent effects are the inherent effects of a school. They weren't the inherent effects of this little 10 acre retreat site. So you can't deem that the legislature meant for there to be a comparison of a little 10 acre retreat site here versus a little 10 acre retreat site there. That's not what they possibly could have had in mind. And that's why Mr. Nelson's test, that you have to pick up this use and plant it a few other places around the county and do the testing, can't possibly be correct and doesn't work. The other reason is if you actually look at Schultz versus Pritz on pages 21 and 22, Judge Davidson used the term such uses about five or six times on those two pages. And each time she was talking about the generic use and how it had been classified by the uh, local legislative body. So she refers to such uses when she's talking about um, churches, which are usually allowed in most zones. But she talks about such uses with schools which are normally allowed in the kind of zones she was talking about in Schultz. And then she talks about such uses as funeral homes, which often are classified as special exceptions, or at least were in that, in that era. So the test that Mr. Nelson proposes of you take our little retreat center and you plant it at different places and see what the impact is, is not what is called for by Schultz. The comparison that is called for by Schultz is this particular use at this particular site versus those inherent impacts, the ones that were considered by the legislature and deemed to be acceptable if the standards set forth in the statute were met. And because in this case, the legislature of Baltimore County deemed that schools were acceptable in the RC2 zone unless there was an excessive you're saying You're saying that the issue of compatibility was determined as to anywhere in the RCT, RC2 zone by the legislature when they made this a special exception use in the text. I would say the issue of general compatibility. And they left to the site specific compatibility of, a, of an application for that special exception to the Board of Appeals. That's per exactly correct. And to the application of its expertise. 
Now, the, the test that's being proposed by the appellants here, um, the, the court was on, on top of some of the practical issues that are associated with it, but it would impose new burdens on landowners in Baltimore County who want to use their lands in ways that have been deemed generally compatible by the county council by putting them to an evidentiary burden that has not been adopted or accepted in any case decided by this court or the Court of Special Appeals or to my knowledge the Baltimore County. Can, uh, I, have, I have a Baltimore County centric question and for some reason the record extract in this case followed, got to my office well after all the briefs, so I didn't have the benefit of the extracts when I was looking at the brief. Um, has Baltimore County, as a planning decision, identified prime agricultural land within the RC2 zone? No. The, the Baltimore County has simply zoned essentially the northern third of the county. Um, in various rural, rural conservation areas. There's a finding of prime and productive soils, but in, in the preamble to this bill, okay? And they say the county is blessed with prime and productive soils. But there is no delineation of this area, which by the way, as the board found, is primarily residential, as being, in Baltimore County's view, different from, you know, a mile to the west or two miles to the east. That's not a planning tool, to my knowledge, that Baltimore County has deemed, and there's certainly no evidence of this in the record. There's evidence you know, related to agronomy in the record, but there's no evidence of a finding by a county authority related to it. The problem with the test proposed by the appellants in this case as I say, is it creates huge practical problems for somebody who wants to use their land in Baltimore County. And we can use this case as a pretty good example because Loyola, in this case, on this land to prove its impact or as, as the board found, its lack of impact, commissioned a comprehensive traffic study that involves not only, you know, right around the, the site, but, you know, nearby intersections. It commissioned uh, hydrologic studies, well water studies that pumped, I believe, as part of the study, hundreds of thousands of gallons of water out to prove that there was adequate water resources on the site that wouldn't impact local wells. It conducted septic studies. It designed a septic system. And it conducted extensive environmental analysis, which proved, by the way, that this facility would have no impact on the trout stream that is nearby. Loyola has spent hundreds of thousands of dollars making that, that proof. If you, if you adopt the same type of analysis being required so that they can do three or four or five or however many sites the other side deems to be appropriate in order to make what they call a reasonable comparison, what you're taking is something that's already a difficult and expensive process because of the high level of public interest and participation in land use issues in Baltimore County. And you're making it one that is prohibitively expensive. And not only that, but impractical. But let's say we take a piece of land over in the Bird River, another one in the North County, and another one in Granite, and we're trying to do these comparative studies. Well, the first thing we've got to do is get the landowners access, because not everybody wants you to dig holes in their land and do perk tests and pump out their well water. The second thing you do is you have to incur the cost of, of all of these things. The third thing is that you've got to get on the land to see exactly what kinds of resources are available on that land so you can perform the proper comparison in all of the categories that have been identified by the Baltimore County Council as areas that we've got to look at the impact in order to get a, a special exception use. And at the end of that process, you come, as Mr. Nelson would have, you come to the Board of Appeals and you say, okay, I chose a piece of land over there, another one here, another one here. I've miraculously gotten access to the land. I've spent all the money and I've got these four uh, other properties. And what are you gonna hear from the opponents? Wrong four properties. But I thought 
I understand the your argument. Again, um, I'm have very little knowledge in terms of zoning law, but I thought that the argument was not so much that you would have to compare on hydrologic and you know and all of that, but you'd look at other sites where there had already been encroachments, where there had already been special exceptions granted, so that the land was more appropriate for this special exception as adverse to this land. I mean, that's what I thought the argument was. I obviously can ask that when they get up again. I think you should, but I, I, I do not think that is the argument because the Baltimore County Council has specifically identified the areas in which an impact analysis has to be made. And those are the eight factors set forth in Section 5. No, what I mean in terms of the other lands, not, not your land. I mean, you wouldn't have to go to uh, Site X your comparative site and site Y and site Z and do all of the studies that you have done on the site that Loyola owns, you would just look at X, Y, and Z and say they have been encroached in a way that Loyola's site has not been and therefore would be more appropriate for this school. Your Honor, that is not the proposal that they've made. Okay. okay. Then I misunderstood that. That is not the proposal that's been made. And it certainly has not been limited in the way that you accept it, uh, you have articulated okay. it. And I don't anticipate that if you were trying this case in front of the Baltimore County Board of Appeals, it would be limited in that way because what we would see is, well, you didn't do this test. Or what you really would see is you've cherry picked the land to prove, the, take the worst possible examples. And you should have looked at these three other sites. Now go do them. Or because you haven't done them, there is, you haven't met your burden. That's the true, but that's, that's part, that's what the adversarial process is about. That's what the adversarial process is about when we're not talking about the Schultz versus Pritz test, because the Schultz versus Pritz test is far more limited. And it's far more limited in this way. It precisely and in so many words says you take the particular use of the particular site and you compare it to the inherent impacts of use. That's the ones that are contemplated by the legislature. Where do you find that? I, I have a hard time imagining that the local legislative bodies are so precise and with good attention to detail when they decide, well, we're going to let this be a special exception in this zone. Let's make a list of all the inherent uh, adverse effects from that proposed use that we are con can conceive of and still say, okay, it's all right in that zone across the board, but in a specific site, no. Where do I find that? Yeah, where do you find those inherent uh, oh, legislative okay. determination of what the inherent adverse effects are of every special exception use that they recognize? There's not a legislative determin of the ad determination of the adverse effects. In this case, there's a laundry list of the factors. Well, yeah, we've, we've got the, we, we have the legislation, but it, it might be helpful, it might not be. But we're pretty familiar with the funeral home issues. Um, and over the years, these kinds of issues have cropped up. But use an analogy to, to explain your analysis of Schultz versus Pritz with respect to the inherent uh, characteristics. I don't know, a tattoo parlor or a, you know, a watch repair shop or an automobile dealership. Because I think that, that one really works the best okay. in, this, in this area. In Sharp, Judge Harrell, you said that this is within the expertise of the local zoning body to recognize. And this is something that's been delegated. To them. So let's look at a school. Well, there's lots of schools in Baltimore County. The people in the Board of Appeals are appointed officials who serve there for a long period of time. Uh, they are presumably expert. That's why we defer to their decisions on things. What are the impacts of a school? The impacts of a school are kids coming and going, nighttime events, sometimes athletics. This is a college, so you're going to have nighttime classes. Schools, colleges are included within the definition of school. They are, there is, um, you know, pep rallies and um, carpool lines. All of the things, I live next to St. Paul School in Baltimore County, so I get the full impact. I have an excellent knowledge of this. 
there are a lot of impacts that are, that are related to schools, and they mostly relate to activity, noise, and traffic. This is what the board is expert in. And this is when you, when you see the board making the comparison that it did in this case. It said, traffic will be minimal. It'll never be congested. There'll be no impact on the trout stream. There will be a minimal impact on the agricultural uses, and it's only 10 acres out of agriculture anyway, and most of it's not going to be impervious surfaces, that there will be um, no impact on anybody else's water, and the septic system is fine and state of the art. All of those things. They can say in their expertise, well, that's not what we would expect with a school, which would be you know, 250, 260 days a year, plus whatever happens over the summer, plus more people than you would have at this place at this time. Those are the inherent impacts as to which a comparison should be made with you. Because the county council approved schools, including colleges in this zone, so long as you can meet your showing on the eight or nine factors set forth in the special exception ordinance. And, the spe and those factors ask you to address the things I've just said, public health, et cetera. And if you make your showing, then you're presumed to be approvable. It is not a comparison with this use at another site. It is not a search for the best site. It is a, it is a regulation of how one can use one's own land. And if one can meet the standards and undertake that burden, which is relatively minimal, then special exception ought to be approved. And that is well within the expertise and discretion of this Board of Appeals, which sits on cases like this every day and knows what not. the impact of a school is and <laughs> undertook extensive evaluation of the impact of this particular proposed use and determined that it would not exceed the inherent. Uh, presumably, Schultz v. Pritz, however one interprets, well, let's put it this way. Do you know of any jurisdictions with power of zoning in Maryland that subscribe to Mr. Zimmerman and uh, Mr. Macy's view of how Schultz v. Fritz should be applied? I am not aware of any such jurisdiction. Now, my practice in land use matters is primarily in Baltimore County, but I have had cases in other areas. And I'm not aware of anyone, anyone that says, as an element of the tort, as it were, you have to put on, put on evidence of some totally, right now, undefined number of other sites in each case, and then be subject to second guessing, opposition, and reversal because you picked the wrong. Well, what about what that. about the Lucas <coughs> case that Mr. Macy cited? The Lucas case, you have to read it carefully. First of all, everything in Lucas on this topic is is different because they decided that the the use wasn't available in that zone, and everything else was in the interest of completely. And the court special guest reference would recognize that in this case. But in Lucas, if you get away from what is really some language that is taken out of context and therefore misleading, where they talk about the vast acreage of the RC2 zone in Baltimore County, in Lucas, if you look at the actual analysis that was performed by both the board and the court, you see what is what they say is the Green Spring Valley is a compact zone with historic aspects. And because of that, this helicopter flying in a couple of times a day in and out is going to have a greater impact here on the small area of the horses <coughs> on the historic nature than it would if we put it, you know, in parked in or somewhere else. That is exactly the Schultz test. They looked at the particular impact in this place. They did not walk through, in their opinion, five or six other potential locations where they say, well, you didn't prove it wouldn't work here, and you didn't prove it wouldn't work here. That's not what Lucas is all about. Lucas is the particular impact in a particular location. And I might say that I might have disagreed with the result of Lucas and that the helicopter was no big deal. But in this case, the Board of Appeals did what it does best, which is it applied its local knowledge and its local understanding of conditions and concluded that the impact of the helicopter on Lucas was too much in that spot. And that's what the board also did in this case, in our case, the Loyola case. They applied their local knowledge and understanding of Baltimore County, geography, zoning, uh, land use issues, and concluded that in this particular spot, where there's already existing residential all around, immediately contiguous to this site, houses, 
in you know, just a line of houses around it, where there is close proximity to highways, that where there is um, very limited impact because of the nature of the proposed use and the extraordinary um, lengths to which oil has gone to reduce its impact, this is less than the inherent impact of a school, which is that, and that is what the county council was willing to accept and put up with and understood would be happening when they put schools into the RC2 zone as a special exception use. The board made that decision based on an enormous factual record. And that's the decision that should be deferred to in this case. Um, much of what Mr. Zimmerman had to say was really a disagreement with the board's findings on those issues. But the fact is that the record they found in the record supports that this is a residential area, that it's not the middle of a prime and productive area, and that it is not appropriate to somehow keep this, keep this landowner from using his land as he wants, or this landowner from using its land as it wants. Be happy to address any other issues that you have. I just want to leave with this thought, that in Baltimore County, over the years, we have put in our uh, appendix to our brief the original bill that created the RC2 zone and permitted schools by special exception. And we put in there the current version of the bill. And what you can see by looking at those two uh, laws is that over the years, the county council has made many, many changes where it has uh, taken special exceptions out, moved permitted uses to special exceptions. At the same, by the same token, as you can see by the extensive process and procedure in this case, the county has a very broad uh, avenue for citizen participation in uh, matters of this nature. In other words, the county council is responsive to the concerns of its citizens when the law needs to be changed or should be changed or when someone feels it ought to be changed. In this case, the answer is not to read the special exceptions that the county council has approved out of the statute. The answer is not to disagree with the findings made by the uh, Board of Appeals based on the extensive record. If there is a good policy reason for there not to be schools or colleges in the RC2 zone, the answer is to remove them from the statute as a, as a special exception use. And the citizens of Baltimore County have the right and ability to do that. They've done it with regard to many other matters. And they can do it here, but it hasn't happened. And under those circumstances, Loyola's application is in accordance with existing law. And this court should defer to the decision of the Board of Appeals approving the special exception use. Thank you, Thank sir. You. <clears throat> Mr. Zimmerman? Two minutes? Or? No, you only reserve one. Right. Now you can have All two. Right. One minute. I want to say that I think there's an overemphasis in isolation on the word inherent, uh, and I, I don't think Schultz was overruling the earlier Court of Appeals decisions, uh, which talk about adverse effects in more general terms, and there's also disruption to the comprehensive zoning plan and legislation, which is part of the context of Schultz. And the legislation in Baltimore County, Section 502.1, doesn't use the word inherent. It lists the various types of adverse effects. So I, I think that this, you, this emphasis and isolation on the word inherent, frankly, is a distortion of the meaning of, of Schultz. It has to be taken in context and in the context of all the cases coming down from Montgomery County versus Merlin on through. And there's a, a whole list of Court of Special Appeals decisions, plus Holbrook in the Court of Appeals on pages six to eight of our brief where we talk about how either explicitly or inferentially the appellate courts have done a comparative locational analysis by virtue of how they describe the locations in question or by explicitly comparing them to other locations. So this is what we're saying is not so novel as some people may have assumed. Mr. Zimmerman, would you address the issue that I raised or leave that for uh, Mr. Nelson? How do you define compact? comparability or comparability, how does somebody present? What is the evidence that someone has to present? The short answer by way of illustration is if you look at Paul Solomon's testimony and Richard Klein's testimony in this case, 
They presented comparisons in terms of quality of agricultural land, type of farm, size of farms. Um, but then they wouldn't have to do a hydrologic? No, they don't have to no, do any of that? Is no, not that's, no, no, that, not at all. It's a case by case. No, that, that's one of these scarecrow arguments. That, that so you look at encroachments, as I that thought you In said. each zone, there are adverse effects. Encroaching agricultural areas is one of the legislatively determined uh, issues in the agricultural zone. In an industrial zone, there would truck facilities, it's other impacts, which another example is in the appendix in our brief, where we, where we included a, a case where the Board of Appeals had evidence on both sides as to other locations and the potential impacts of trucking facilities. So it's, it's, it's not mathematical. Nobody ever said they, they got to do soil borings on somebody else's site. It, uh, he was responding. I'm, I'm done. I'm done. Is Thank that you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Nelson. I reserved seven minutes, supposed to one. No, you, no you, you, you had seven. That's right. Uh, Judge Harrell asked a question about how Baltimore County deals with prime and productive so soils. I'd like to respond to that. In my experience, they refer to the U.S. Geological Survey, the, the document that, that maps all the land in the state, including Baltimore County. The evidence, and I was looking for the page site during the Army, I couldn't put my finger on it, but, but uh, Wayne McGinnis described the soils at this site as prime productive. Uh, the applicant's expert, Robert Sheasley, acknowledged that they were prime and productive soils. He also acknowledged when he was the director of Baltimore County's Department of Environmental Protection 15 early, years earlier, he had uh, 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 opposed a project, a development on prime productive soils. So they have a mechanism to look at prime and productive soils in Baltimore County. Uh, Judge Murphy asked for an analogy, and this is the, to describe the principle, and this is the analogy I use. My adversaries say, Compare the adverse effects of the proposed use at this site with the adverse effects of that type of use at the same site. That my colleague then says, look, this is a small weekend spiritual retreat, uh, 100, and, uh, I don't know how many days a year, but on weekends with a school bus, we'll be around the clock. It's gonna be a place for prayer and contemplation. What's the big deal as compared to a college? I respectfully uh, re reject that argument because what they're really saying is you compare the adverse effects of the proposed use with a larger version of the proposed use, a college, the largest one in this state, of course, is University of Maryland College Park. So you can always imagine a larger version of the proposed use. You can always make College Park bigger. So, so under their analysis, any special exception application will be approved. Uh, Judge Harrell asked whether there are any jurisdictions uh, employing the interpretation of Schultz that we're advocating here. And I would say yes, the District Council in Prince George's County uh, has done so in, in uh, a case which is now pending in the Court of Special Appeals. Uh, it, it, it did so in another case that was affirmed by the Court of Special Appeals. But so yes, they, they were doing that. But to be frank, Lower courts and low and zoning bodies are all over the map on this issue. Now that's the bottom line, in my opinion. I think one gains insight into Schultz by looking at the case it rejected, which is the Gowell case. And what Gal, the, the thinking in the pre-Schultz versus Pritz era was if an applicant for a special exception could show that the adverse effects of the special exception use were no greater than a permitted use, what's the big deal? Allow the special exception. That's the Gal rule. Schultz rejected that rule. Now we've had a lot of debate about the comparison of how many sites, representative or average, but, and, and I don't want to reiterate all that, but let's look at the Board of Appeals opinion at pages uh, 35 where they're talking about traffic. Our point in this case 
is that, the, and Wayne McGinnis articulated this, and Lynn Jones articulated this, is that the roads in this area, this, far, this intensely agricultural area, are narrow with steep banks and no shoulders, 17 feet wide. So we say there will be an adverse effect present here, this is our argument below, because you can't get a combine past a school bus on this road. It's too narrow, there's no shoulder, and we had ex elegant evidence from Lynn Jones from all over the county of the width of the roads and the width of the shoulders in other parts of the county. And no one contradicted that testimony. So what the board did at page uh, 35, I grab my Why extract. Why a school bus with a combine? <laughs> yeah. is, a combine. Without even knowing it, they Damn, used the Gowell standard. They, they say, there's already a problem. You can't get a combine past the VW. You can't get a combine against another combine on this road, Mr. Nelson. So what's the big deal if you have a school bus there? Right? That's what they said at pages. I had this all organized before the argument. Um, uh, at pages uh, 19 dash 20, correction, pages 47 and 48 of the extract, the board says, <coughs> however, it is clear from their own testimony, we're talking about traffic, that the problem already exists. Their farm equipment on the road now must cope with any traffic in the area. Even considering other rural air roads at alternate sites suggested by protestants, large agricultural equipment would take up most of those roads. A any allowed use, any allowed use by right or special exception proposed for the subject site will generate additional traffic, even a continued agricultural use. That's the GAL standard which Schultz rejected. So we could talk all day about how many other sites uh, you've got to look at, but the bottom line is, in this case, the Board of Appeals adopted the GAL, or employed the GAL standard, which Schultz rejected uh, in 1981. So for all of those reasons, uh, we thank the court again. We're grateful for the court's attention. It's a very important issue. My clients care deeply about it, as does Loyola, but we're grateful for the court's attention. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.